welcome to Discovery Reading. We're going to give everybody just a few seconds to tune in and also talk a little bit really quick about what we're going to be doing today. The theme today is animal covering. So we're going to be talking about what protects animals. Do they have skin? Do they have feathers? Do they have fur? What do they have? So those are that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we're reading two books today and both of them have beautiful illustrations and stories about a bunch of different types of animals. So it's gonna be really, really good. Okay, I can see we've got a couple people logging on. So we'll just give everybody a few minutes, but while we're waiting, I'll read the titles, okay, and show you the, the cover art. And we're reading with permission of these publishers, which we'll announce as we, as we officially start reading. So the first book that we're gonna be reading is called Panda Whispers. I guess maybe we can, we can invert the image, I think. We'll see. Mm. There we go, now you guys can read Panda Whispers. Then we'll put this back so you guys can read. I can read your comments. And the other book that we'll be reading is called Under the Snow. There we go. Neat, now you guys can read the letters. This is exciting. So we'll just wait maybe one more minute and we'll be ready to start. If you can recognize where we are in the museum, feel free to comment if you recognize this place from your visits, you probably do. I'll give you a hint. It normally has something spinning in the middle. If you know this place, comment. I'll tell you where we are at the end. Okay, let's get started. So this first book is called Panda Whispers. It is by Mary Beth Owens. And we are reading with permission from their publisher, um, which is the Dutton's Children's Book um, publisher, and it's a division of the Penguin Young Readers Group. And this book has a special note from the author, which says, For my father who whispers, think happy thoughts. In the treetops, by the river, on the mountains, plains, and sea, creatures settle down to sleep and dream sweet dreams like you and me. On a mountain, mist is settling. Panda cuddles with her cub, pointing to the tallest tree. She gives him his back a gentle rub. Panda whispers, Dream of climbing. Resting in the rolling ocean, sleepy dolphins close their eyes. High above, a golden moon is tossed into the starlit sky. Dolphin whispers, leap up higher. Hidden in the waves of grass, Cheetah and her kittens lie as they sleep and dream of running storm clouds race across the sky. Cheetah whispers, fast as lightning. On a sparkling hill of sea ice, rocking on his father's toes, Drowsy little penguin dreams of sliding everywhere he goes. Penguin whispers, use your belly. From a treetop in the forest, Lima rocks her babies three. Watching branches swing and sway, they dream of leaping tree to tree. Lemur whispers, hold on tight. In the tallest mango tree sheltered from the noonday sun, mother fruit bat and her pups sleep and dream of nighttime fun. Fruit bat whispers, swooping down.
underneath a shooting star, llamas hum near mountain steep, dreaming of the things they'll find waiting at the highest peak. Llama whispers, top of the world. Reeds are stirring in the river, alligators smiling wide, hatchlings resting on their mother, dream of where they're going to hide. Alligator whispers, I can't see you. Can you smile big like an alligator? In the shadows near the water, swan and cygnets on their nest dream of nibbling lily roots after waking from their rest. White swan whispers, bottoms up. Cradled in a bed of seaweed, otter pup and mother sleep. Round about them, clouds of bubbles rise up from the ocean deep. Otter whispers, school of minnows. In a den beside the meadow, stars above are shining bright. Mother fox and kit awaken to the cur curious sound of night. Red fox whispers, you'll find crickets. Snug within a cozy nest, restless mice are settling down, dreaming of the tasty seeds of hidden berries to be found. Field, mice, field mouse whispers, You'll help find them. In a bedroom, child and father hear the ocean in the night. Dream you'll sail to a far off place, then sail back by morning's light. Father whispers, I'll be waiting here. Good night. Okay, let's talk about one of the animals that we saw in here and talk about their skin for a second. Let me pull it up. We're gonna talk about that alligator because I brought with me an alligator leg so we could kind of look at their skin up close and you could see what it looks like and kind of imagine what it feels like. So this is the animal that we're gonna be talking about, this alligator right here. Okay, so this leg that I brought with me is from an American alligator. We'll move our card around so we can keep our specimens nice. Okay, so this is from an American alligator. You can see how long these alligator fingernails are. These are their claws, which they use to dig and bury themselves in sand. Sometimes when they're basking on the shore trying to take in that warm sunlight to keep their bodies warm, you can see that their skin is quite thick. This is my finger in comparison. So it's about a finger thick, my index finger. And you, I'll let you guys look up close to see the texture, texture of this. And you can hear it's very tough and hard. And it kind of looks like individual scales, but they're not scales. But their skin is very textured. So this is tough. The sides of their arms also kind of have these claws for protection. Normally, the alligators, this is a flattened pelt that it would be wrapped around. So these claws would kind of be around the elbow right here on the side of the arm to protect them while they swim or if they were going to fight with somebody else. Yeah, so this is one of our, one of our coverings that we have from that book. Awesome. I'm gonna show you guys another covering that's really tough and kind of hard, just like this one, okay? And our Discovery Reading friends will know who this is. This is Thunder. And Thunder is an Eastern Box Turtle. Thunder also has a very tough outer covering. Do you know what this covering is called? If you know, you can totally send it in the comments. Or if you have any questions about Thunder, please feel free to send them in. Thunder is looking beautiful. Thunder has lots of orange on his face right now, which means he has plenty of vitamins. You can see thunder, similar to the alligator, also has long claws and a little bit of more texture, kind of on the elbow or the outside of the arm. And one of the things that makes the eastern box turtle so unique 
is that when they're scared, they can actually use this bottom hinge right here and completely shut inside their shell. Most turtles, when they go inside of their shell, their nose will peek out or their toes, but the box turtle shuts inside of their box and can be completely inside of their shell. So that is very cool. So this is another shell that's, again, very hard like the alligators, very tough, also kind of is textured and looks like it's made of scales, but it's not. It is not good. If there are any questions, you can feel free to send them in at any time and we can come back to them too. If you're still thinking or typing while we're moving through, my discovery readers, they know that turtles are born inside of their shells. We always laugh and say they wear the same clothes every day for their whole life, right? And so their shell grows with them. So one thing that a predator might do to break that outer barrier would be to fly up in the sky and to drop a turtle to break his shell. That's one way that somebody would try to attack a turtle. And that could be maybe a bird or a hawk or maybe a smaller mammal that eats meat. So good. Oh, we've got a couple questions. How old is this turtle? This turtle, I believe, is about seven years old. Some of the turtles that we have were given to the museum. Thunder's not one, but some of them are older, but they can live for a very long time. They can live, I believe, for about 40 years. So they live for a super long time. Good question. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie and Dan. You asked about the exact same time. So thanks. Cool. We're going to keep going. So we've got more specimens to see. Oh, what does he eat? Carrie, um, Thunder eats a salad every day. So Thunder salad has lettuce in it, sometimes a little squash, um, some bell peppers, and some calcium vitamins right on the top so that he can keep his orange on his face and be super healthy. Thanks for that question. We'll keep going. We've got some more specimens to see. I brought up more specimens today. Okay, this book is called Under the Snow, and we are reading with permission from Peachtree Atlanta publisher. And this book is by Melissa Stewart and is illustrated by Constance R. Virgil. Oh, Kristen says to bring the turtle closer one more time. We can do that right now really fast while we get there. Get him right up to the camera. It's a mirrored image, so you can see him really close. Thanks for reminding me. Everybody needs to see him really close. Yeah, so you can see that orange. He's kind of keeping his head up tall because he's proud to be on the internet, so you can't see his orange very well. There you go, maybe a little bit better right there. And you can see his little claws. Oh, this way. And he has a really little tail. Perfect. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay, awesome. So again, this is Under the Snow, and it's by Melissa Stewart, and is illustrated by Constance R. Burgum, and we're reading with permission from Peachtree Atlanta Publishing. In the heart of winter, a deep layer of snow blankets, fields, and fields and forest ponds and wetlands. You spend your day sledding and skating and having snowball fights, but under the snow lies a hidden world. Under the snow, in a field, dozens of ladybugs pack themselves into a gap in an old stone wall. Below them, a snake rests in a hole all its own. Do you see those ladybugs on this page? And then there's a snake in there too. And they're trying to stay warm, right you guys? Voles spend their day tunneling through the snow. When they find a young tree, they slowly strip off layers of bark and eat them. Voles are a rodent, if you've never heard of what those are before.
Below the ground, a chipmunk snoozes for a few days at a time. Between naps, it snacks on the nuts and seeds stored in a burrow. Under the snow, in a forest, a mourning cloak butterfly takes cover in a pile of ash. Inside a rotting log, a centipede and a bumblebee queen remain silent and still until spring. There we go. Do you see that dark butterfly and our bumblebee queen? A wood frog nestles in scattered leaves on the forest floor. It can freeze solid and still survive. Not far along, a woolly bear caterpillar spends the winter curled up in a tight ball. Could you imagine that, you guys? What if you were frozen like an ice cube all winter? Just below the ground, a spotted salamander waits out the coldest months of the year. Deeper down, a woodchuck sleeps soundly all winter long. Its heart rate drops and its breathing slows. The animal gets all the energy it needs from its thick layer of fat. Under the snow on a pond, bluegills circle slowly through the chilly water. They don't have enough energy to chase the water boatman swimming nearby. A carp rests quietly on the muddy bottom. It isn't even tempted by the water striders lying just a few inches away. Buried in the mud, a frog and a turtle wait out the winter. They never move and they barely breathe. Does anybody know what this process is called where they take their long winter's nap? Comment if you do and we'll talk about it. Under the snow in a wetland, a beaver family huddles together inside a cozy lodge. When they get hungry, they swim to their food storage pile and munch on some sticks. But even on the coldest winter days, red spotted newts dodge and dart, whiz and whirl just below the ice. As time passes, the sun's rays slowly grow stronger. Each day is a little bit longer. Animals living in fields and forests, ponds and wetlands begin to get ready for spring. So this is kind of how Provo is starting to look, huh, you guys? It's starting to get a little bit warmer. And so do you. Okay, we saw quite a few animals in this book, right? The first one that I want to talk about is a fish. This book had answered the question I always had before I lived in Utah. What do the fish do when winter comes and they're under the ice? They're swimming basically in slow motion, in slow motion, saving as much energy as possible. This is kind of a, a research mount for our fish, so it's not actually a real fish. It's just a model to look at up close. But Fish have scales. That's what type of covering they have. This is a model of a rainbow trout. This is our standard fish that you would see along the Provo River here in Utah. Anytime you're fishing, this is probably the most common fish that you're going to catch. So this is our rainbow trout. And again, they're covered in individual scales. You can kind of see that modeled in the way that this shines in the light. It's a really cool model of this fish. And the fish that we saw in the book was a bluegills. Good. One of the other really cool animals we saw in the last book, and this one was kind of talked about birds. And this is a grouse. 
from our collection, and you can see he has tiny feathers on his body and on the top of his head. This is a unique animal covering. Can you think of any other animal that has feathers in the whole world other than birds? Mm -mm. Sometimes the kids will say dinosaurs, and I go, ah, that's true. But we don't see dinosaurs around right now. But these feathers are very unique. This is a very cool pattern that it makes them very camouflaged in high grasses, and they're awesome. We have tons of grouses here in Utah as well. This specific grouse is the sharp-tailed grouse. Awesome. If we're going to speak about winter, we have to talk about one of the coolest winter animals, literally one of the coolest, and that's the polar bear. So I wanted to show you guys this polar bear fur and kind of describe how it feels so you can kind of think what it is like. This polar bear fur, it's not exactly white. People who've seen it before know it's kind of a dark yellow, actually. And if I could describe what these fur bristles feel like, it honestly kind of feels like a really long hair toothbrush. These hairs are really, really thick. They're really strong to defy the elements. They do have an undercoat. This one not so much because it's been pet a ton. But that thicker undercoat is a little bit more woolly. And then it has these long, tough bristles on the top, which again feel like toothbrush. They're really rough. So this is our polar bear fur. So you guys can see this special covering. And what animals are covered with fur? Mammals. So polar bears are mammals as well. So they have their big fur coat on. We'll put it close. Maybe you can see the color a little bit. If we roll it back in the light. It's kind of yellow. Cool. We have one more animal. This book talked about snakes hibernating in a wall, so I wanted to bring you one of my favorite snakes at the museum. This is Reggie. You guys know who my favorite is. And Reggie's one of my favorite snakes because Reggie has such awesome colors. And Reggie is a corn snake. We'll bring him close so you guys can see him. Actually, Reggie's actually a girl. Miss Reggie would be a better title. Yeah, if we tip Reggie down like this, you can see that Reggie kind of has some dark reds. The main colors are kind of pink on Reggie's body. And Reggie does kind of have red eyes. And so these corn snakes, they're very common, um, especially in the Midwest, kind of where corn is grown. That's part of where they get their name. But we do have corn snakes here in Utah. They're also really common pets, and so they're selectively bred to have different colors. Their natural color is more of like a dark Utah rock red, maybe closer to the color of my fingernails. And again, we've talked about this before, but Reggie's cuddling up against my arm because my arm is so warm, and snakes are cold-blooded, and they love to be warm. When Reggie was waiting to see you guys, Reggie was waiting on her heating pad just because she loves it. But she's very, very warm and happy today, which is really good. If anybody has any questions about Reggie that we haven't answered before, I'd love to. Let's see if we can get really close so you can see Reggie's tongue. You see that Reggie's tongue is forked? Let's see if you can see it again. Yeah, there we go. So it looks like this. This is really good because when these snakes um, shed their skin, they even shed a scale that goes over their eye. So when their skin is shedding, their eyes turn kind of a cloudy gray and they really can't see hardly at all and their skin is very sensitive. So this is a very vulnerable time for a snake when they're shedding their skin. So they really rely on their sense of smell. And so that's what this forked tongue is for. It can help them figure out what direction a smell is coming from. It's a really cool adaptation, these forked tongues. And lizards also have forked tongues, if you've seen them before. Cool. If there are no questions, look, he's going to peep through my fingers. If there aren't any questions about Reggie, we'll probably be almost wrapped up. Um, I'll give you guys some announcements. Tomorrow we're going to have a collections tour with Josh at 11, because tomorrow's Wednesday. And then I'll be back on Thursday for another discovery reading. We're going to be having events every day at 11 mountain time because we know we have some people watching from other places um, and on Friday again we'll be having another life science live with a special topic so you'll have to tune in to see that but again tomorrow at 11 we're going to be doing a collections tour so that is that if there are no last questions it's so good to see you guys I've missed you it's been a couple of weeks 
and I'll see you guys again on Thursday. Thanks, you guys.